Hi, I'm Lucy Brogdon, Chair of the National Mental Health Commission Advisory Board. Welcome to this online conference. What an innovative approach to sharing knowledge and learnings right across the country. I understand there are thousands of you online ready to learn and work. The Mental Health Professional Network is truly taking a novel way to share wisdom with all of you and it's to be applauded. Working better together is the theme of this conference and it's a great opportunity to learn more about mental health in the military, about grief and loss and about trauma and adverse childhood experiences, all important topics that need our best attention and our best minds tackling these issues. We know the issues faced by our military and the risk to develop mental illness. We also know there are protective factors. This conference will bring together that conversation and work out how we best protect our serving people. Grief and loss affect all of us at different stages in our life. Understanding what drives that in people and how to best support them in their journey is really important. One of the frustrations for me at the National Mental Health Commission is seeing how stubbornly our incidence of mental health sits when we look at other non-communicable diseases. And what we know is that it is trauma and adverse childhood experiences that often lead people to a journey in the mental health system. If we can better address those experiences in childhood, prevent them, mitigate their impact, and try and understand trauma, we set so many people on a more positive journey through life. Thank you all for coming online to join the conference and to be part of these important conversations. I wish you every success. Thank you. Hello everybody and uh, welcome to tonight's uh, online conference, uh, Working Better Together and as part of that uh, uh, Emerging Minds and MHPN uh, jointly bring you um, our series on um, adverse childhood uh, events and uh, in particular regarding infant and child mental health. We're really pleased to be able to bring you uh, tonight's presenters and tonight's content. Um, and there's about 725 of you who have, uh, have joined in um, for this webinar so far tonight. So we welcome each of you and uh, look forward to tonight. We also uh, welcome the viewers uh, who are watching this through, through podcast. Um, and thank you all for your um, uh, interest in the uh, in the online conference. Um, so far, we've got over 7,000 registrants um, for uh, the conference, the online conference for which tonight's webinar is part of that. Um, before we get started tonight, uh, we'd like to uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land across Australia, upon you all which you will join us, and uh, we wish to pay respect to the elders past, present and future, for the memories, the traditions, the culture and hopes of, of traditional and Indigenous Australians. This webinar is the first activity in the trauma, the impact of adverse childhood experiences stream in MHPN's online conference, Working Better Together. So welcome. We've got a great panel for you tonight. Uh, my name's Dan Moss and it's a pleasure for me to be uh, facilitating tonight. I'm the Workforce Development Manager at Emerging Minds. And um, joining us tonight are Professor Kirsty Douglas, Nicola Palfrey and Dr Elizabeth Hine. Uh, so um, we might start with you Kirsty, if we can. Um, uh, you've got uh, really um, great experience both as a GP and as a researcher. So I'd just like to know from you um, before we start, what have you become most interested in uh, in terms of thinking about um, adverse childhood experiences on children? Um, well Dan, I'm, I, I'm a researcher but my research really hasn't been so much in the adverse childhood experiences up until more recently. Um, I really became interested in adverse childhood experiences um, through my clinical general practice and um, as I worked um, with women who um, survived um, domestic violence, as I was dealing with um, people with 
um, a lot of chronic illnesses such as obesity and stuff. More and more, if I asked about previous experience, adverse experiences, I just found they were everywhere to be seen. So it was really through an, an gradually increased understanding of just how prevalent they were amongst adults that I was seeing that I thought, well, surely we need to know more about this and, and understand it better so that we can intervene earlier. Um, so that's, it was really from a, from a clinical presentation point of view that I became interested. Thanks for that, Kirsty. Uh, our next panellist tonight is Nicola Palfrey. Nicola, um, uh, as a psychologist, um, what are the, what are the fund fundamental approaches that you've used um, in working with children who have experienced adverse childhood experiences? Hi, Dan, and thanks for having me. Um, I think in the work that I've done with children and families of experience, adverse childhood experiences, the, the fundamentals are similar to working in any uh, family systems, I suppose, is trying to understand the child in their context of not only their adversities but also the protective factors in their life and really importantly working with the child and their caregivers to try and do wraparound support to see whilst we can understand what the experiences um, may have led to some of the issues they're having. Um, also trying to work with the strengths of the family to, to see how we can make sense of what's happened and, and move forward. Great. Thank you, Nicola. I look forward to your presentation uh, later this evening. Um, and next is uh, Dr. Elizabeth Hone. Elizabeth, as a psychiatrist, um, can you tell us a little bit about how you differentiate trauma from other conditions that uh, you might see, such as attachment disorder, ADHD, autism, or maybe other behavioural issues? Um, good evening, Dan, and everyone who's online. Um, thank you for having me. I think um, a really important part of trying to differentiate different conditions is taking a really good history and really understanding the background of what's happening for the child and the young person and the infant who present to you. Um, I think the example story we're using tonight really demonstrates just how complex often issues are and they are in the background. And we, I tend to kind of go by a bit of a mantra that says all behaviour has meaning and trying to understand the meaning behind the behaviour that we're seeing I often kind of think of an iceberg with um, the behaviour being the bit that we can see but there's so much more underneath and in trying to take a good history, really trying to understand what's going on, that's where we can start to really tease apart what the etiological issues might be and also what's sort of underpinning the presentations and help with a differential diagnosis. Mm, that's really interesting. Thank you for that, Elizabeth. We look forward to hearing your uh, presentation later tonight. Um, so before we go on, I'd just like to introduce people to the webinar platform. Um, and so there is a chat box uh, available tonight, which is for general chat amongst other health professionals in the audience. Um, and thank you to Jackie, who's um, facilitating that for us tonight. Uh, and so through the night, we will discuss resources, um, uh, particularly toward the end of the webinar, which are kind of germane to uh, the topic of tonight and we'll be able to sh um, share those with you. If you do have any technical issues, please click the technical support FAQs tab for which uh, you can get some help for technical issues. There's a number to call if you need further uh, support. And please, I encourage you at the end of tonight to provide feedback at the webinar's conclusion uh, by completing the feedback survey which is loaded under the survey tab at the top of the screen. Uh, so, learning outcomes for tonight. At the webinar's completion, uh, we'd really like uh, participants, all participants, to be able to define the key characteristics of adverse childhood experiences. And we might call them ACEs throughout the course of tonight. Um, we'd like them to be able to define the prevalence and their impact on children in Australia. We'd like participants to identify evidence-based effective coordinated practice for early intervention and prevention for children who have or are experiencing ACEs. And to implement strategies to support parents and children to make sense of adversity 
in order to promote resilience and recovery. So what is an ACE? And obviously um, a definition of that is really important for uh, both tonight's webinar but uh, for the um, rest of the, the series that's uh, happening over the next few weeks um, in this third uh, stream of the conference. So an adverse childhood experience, ACE, is a potentially stressful or traumatic event experienced during childhood which can produce chronic or toxic stress responses in children that can persist through the life course. They can have potentially profound impact on later development of chronic diseases, mental health issues and problematic social functioning. The most widely recognised and researched ACEs include childhood physical, sexual and emotional abuse, physical neglect and emotional neglect, exposure to family violence, parental substance abuse, parental mental illness and parental separation or divorce and parental incarceration. So uh, now uh, what I'd like to do is hand you over um, to hear from uh, our GP, uh, Professor Kirsty Douglas, um, in terms of working with uh, ACEs from the GP's perspective. Kirsty, welcome again. Thanks very much. Um, so I understand um, you've all seen the video uh, link and I was asked to sort of comment on a GP's role in that respect and how that made me feel. And I guess, I mean, as a GP, you are very likely to be providing care to the parents, the foster parents, and well as, as well as to the um, And so part of your role is to provide a safe space for the parents to talk, share their fears and doubts, and to be able to be heard because it's a really challenging job. Um, it's about educating and linking to resources such as some of those ones that are available on Emerging Minds or um, you know, the, the other child resources to provide parents with a greater understanding of what they're facing and what teammates might be facing. Um, as a GP obviously we care for people in-house but we often um, frequently need to ex uh, refer to external support and you know that a critical issue is making sure that you know what your local resources are. Always we're also providing that basic medical care and we know that um, families under stress and children who have um, experienced ACEs do have higher rates of all sorts of um, medical and psychological issues. Um, and I think also importantly you can in your interactions with T herself model a caring professional relationship that has clear boundaries and, and that might be relatively subtle and might occur over a long time but I think still is, can be quite helpful. And in terms of dealing with the, the foster family it's about helping them with perspective. We're in this and T's in this for the long game um, and sometimes the more you read about ACEs the more challenged or depressed you can get but you know most GPs are well aware that many people have challenging starts but it's not everybody is swamped by it and so a difficult start in life is not a diagnosis for despair and a difficult start when you've got supportive people around you such as um, involved and persisting um, foster parents and a caring and well linked um, caring team is, is much more positive. So I was then also um, asked to give my initial thoughts about the scenario as we saw it. And I mean my, my first response is T's history includes ACEs. She really wouldn't be in foster care otherwise. Um, in terms of my thoughts about the behaviour that um, T is um, exhibiting, it that's who is, is really consistent with a child who has been exposed to ACEs. You know, there appears to be some inappropriate affection at times and, and that is often an indicator of attachment issues which may well be present. Um, and it, you know, it may, she may have learned those ways of behaviour to keep safe when she was in an unsafe situation. And she may just be seeking reassurance but you also probably also have to have in the back of mind to be aware of of sexualised behaviour as a potential indicator of previous sexual abuse. 
when I'm thinking about the sort of the outbursts and the periods of being disengaged, you know, that, that is probably or could potentially be her communicating her stress um, and distress through, through her behaviour. So I think in the first instance, as a GP, I would be wanting to acknowledge the challenges that the, the parents and family face and, and agree it's a really hard job, but also to recognise, celebrate and value their contribution to T's wellbeing for now and potentially into the future. And I'd be really supportive of them and reassuring that, you know, the evidence is that they can make a difference and they can make a big difference to T's prospects for a happy life from here on. As a GP, one of the big bits of advice I would say to other GPs is, you know, these are the families that you never try and see in 15 minutes. I, this family would automatically be on my book along consultation list, even if it's not asked for. It gives you and them the space to, to listen and be heard. Um, we we'll often need to and want to refer to psychologists or social workers um, in order to develop a supportive team that can wrap around this family. Um, and one of the main things I try and think of then is stability in a team is, really, is going to be quite important. It's not always easy to achieve, but I as a GP tend to have a small group of trusted allied healthcare workers, psychologists, social workers that I know um, listen to me and who communicate with me and I make an effort to make sure I'm communicating well with them. And then it's the issue about um, being embedded in your local community and knowing your local resources. Sort of the resources that spring to mind that I might want to use with this family is potentially sort of looking at circular security training. If you can get in, it's not it's in the ACT where I work, it's very hard to access, but it is really valuable if you can. Um, I would often be looking at referring this family to a child psychologist. Um, and again, here where I work, there are often issues around affordability, but some um, access to people, to, to resources for those that can't um, access it in private. And again, we have um, state funded or territory funded child and family centres, which often have very good family resources that can be drawn on. So they would be the first ones that I'm uh, I'm thinking about. If I was trying to give feedback to the family, particularly about initial help in responding to outbursts as we were trying to unpack sort of longer term plans, I would be encouraging the foster parents at those times of the outburst to really try and provide consistent caring responses um, because that's probably what has been missing previously for T. And, and to reassure them that it's, it's all right to set boundaries and to have explicit expectations. But it's really also important to try and avoid shaming T. And so getting that balance right between, you know, withholding approval of um, inappropriate behaviour, but never withhold the care and concern about what's underlying that, that behaviour. Um, and I'd be getting the foster parents to, um, while we were trying to get referrals and other supports in place to, to reflect and observe on the experiences or activities that they think seem to trigger these disengaged or aggressive outbursts because that may well be important in understanding where her, where she's most distressed and why she's likely to, to be distressed. And again, I would be encouraging um, the parents to be vigilant at times when she is affectionate with strangers because that is a time when she may be putting herself at risk. So. We need to be aware of that and, and just encourage them to be extra vigilant. And so that was really my sort of initial responses as a sort of clinician to that trigger. Thank you so much for that, Kirsty. That was a really uh, interesting and informative uh, presentation and look forward to asking you some questions about that later in the night. Um, our next presenter, as you've uh, been introduced, is uh, Nicola Palfrey. Uh, before Nicola starts uh, providing us uh, um, a psychologist perspective, just like to um, welcome those viewers that have, have just joined and uh, let everyone know that we've got well over a thousand uh, people uh, tuning in at the moment. So again, thank you everyone for your interest in, in tonight's webinar. Nicola, over to you. 
Thanks, Dan. No pressure, Dan. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, thank you, Dan, and thank you, Kirsty. I think that was a fantastic presentation and uh, hopefully segues well into the psychologist perspective that I'm going to try and provide this evening. So uh, to start off with, if I was to say receive a referral, referral from Kirsty um, to work with T and her family, the first class place you would start really is what do we know already? And so from the limited information we already have, it's clear that T has experienced multiple ACEs in her short life. Um, the information we've re received uh, has articulated that she's been living with carers for her uh, birth family who had alcohol and drug dependence. Um, and that in almost inevitably, when it's really problematic, leads to a chaotic lifestyle. And that may not always be a defined ACE, in a, a survey, but we, we do know that that is really something that can be problematic for children when they're trying to establish their sense of security and get their needs met when they're, when they're very young. Um, the information refers to unsafe. Again, we don't really know what kind of unsafe that means, whether it's um, neglect or abuse. But however, just the fact that poor little T has been living in a really unsafe situation we know puts her in a, in a really tricky situation for her trying to um, regulate herself and feel safe and connected with people. Um, as Kirsty mentioned, she'd been placed in foster care and, and really you can't be placed in foster care without having um, ex been exposed to multiple ACEs in, in your life. Um, so from the brief description, as Kirsty also mentioned around some of these behaviours and outbursts, um, there are maybe some suggestions that they may be experiencing um, or exhibiting signs of some type of attachment insecurity, which is important and helpful sometimes in terms of how we might frame the work for the family. So there's a query, I suppose, that I'd be holding in my head around uh, certainly um, perhaps disorganised attachment. And what that means is that children such as he who have been exposed to this chaos and violence and and, and real difficulty within their household um, really have struggled throughout their life to get their needs met consistently. So they don't have one particular way of being with their caregiver that means that they can be assured that they will be looked after. Um, so they have to try different strategies. So even children that we know have insecure attachments have a strategy that works some of the time. So either them staying very close to their caregiver and being um, not too far away from the nest to speak gets their needs met, other children who hide their needs and kind of seem very self-assured and resilient can get their needs met. But for someone like T, um, she's really had to try and try and try different things with the different adults who she's come in contact with to, to get um, her basic needs met. And so that means she's actually been very adaptive in that environment. She might be precocious sometimes or aggressive, overly friendly and those sorts of things. And that obviously works at some time because attachment styles keep us alive. That's why we do them. However, the problem can be that we know that when you have those early experiences, those behaviours last longer than they need to. So even though she's now in a loving and caring foster family that she doesn't need to behave in that way to get her needs met, um, it takes a little while for, for the you to retrain and, and she will have to retrain her brain and her natural responses in order to try and um, see that she can get her needs met in, in different ways. So where do we start? And I think uh, sometimes it can feel overwhelming. Um, parents, uh, foster parents are coming in overwhelmed. Um, you see a distressed really little girl and you can feel it's very difficult to know where to start. And I think starting with some basic understanding and com communication of what we know about the impact of adversity on children without overwhelming families can be really helpful, particularly for, the, for these parents and foster parents, we call them the parents, they're taking care of her, to um, meet her needs and understand why those early experiences um, are playing out in the way they are. So this disorganised attachment style is trying a different strategies all the time is really also a reflection of our attachment style which moulds our sense of self, your internal working model. A lot of um, the viewers will understand that, that language, but it really is where I, who I, I am in the world, how do I see myself, um, am I a good, good little girl, am I a bad child, what do I need to do in order to feel safe and secure. And so obviously when those have been shaped by frightening early experiences, um, it's going to shape your approach to relationships. And as Kirsty's already mentioned, um, well, 
and Elizabeth in an introduction that really we want to start thinking about what is the behaviour communicating because that's how um, we really need to frame what's going on for tea. Again, reinforcing it can't be underplayed that children that have experienced these early um, adversities and danger in life um, and end up with a style of disorganised attachment perhaps um, are at greater risk of, of future abuse. So we need to really not underplay the need to be ensuring boundaries and protecting T and explicitly teaching her um, protective behaviours so she can um, be helped keep herself safe. And that needs to be taught without shame. So this is something she needs to learn. It's not any fault of hers that she behaves in this way, but we need to be able to give her um, examples and, and support in appropriate boundaries. So some concepts that can be helpful in terms of working with the parents and uh, helping them to feel less overwhelmed, I, I suppose, and give that sense of hope that Kirsty was talking about, is um, the backhanded compliment. Now, what we mean by that is children that have had early experiences where uh, connecting with adults or seeking support or comfort from adults has been dangerous or painful or downright over frightening, um, kids are going to avoid that. It's not consciously, but when they start to get close to people and start to feel connected, like they she will with her foster parents, she may reject that and reject it quite hard. And that can be extraordinarily painful um, emotionally for the adults. But really, that what we when we see that, we know that we're getting somewhere, which can seem counterproductive. But it is that uh, if, if you've been hurt by getting close, then it makes sense that a child will push against that. Um, uh, it's really important about that repair of the relationship and coming back in as the adult to to, to, to feel like there's actually a sign you're getting somewhere. But the adults will need support in that because it doesn't feel like you're getting somewhere. It actually feels like your whole world's been turned upside down. And so the, the next point, the parallel process, what's been going on for T in her life is often mirrored in what's going on in the adult's life. So that the adults really need support. Um, it's not just interaction with the child you need to support the adults to be able to support T and just a comment from the foster family that struck me was she may be better off with another family um, and mirroring how T may see her place in the world that she's the parents are better off without her or she doesn't really belong so sometimes acknowledging that and talking about that can be helpful. Anger is a secondary emotion um, is a notion where a lot of people are familiar with that Anger is um, the expressed emotion, but what behind it, what's behind it is often much more vulnerable emotions of fear or shame or um, sadness. And developmental versus chronological age. So um, T at times could be operating exactly at her age level in terms of the, 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 the months that she's been on this earth, but other times she'll be behaving perhaps at a more regressed age because of the stress that she's been under and, and how we need to adapt to meet those needs. So. Um, that can be helpful for families as well to understand that that's not a bad thing to meet the child where they're at. Um, finally, when you're working, as I said at the start, you'd be working not with her on, on her own, you'd be working with um, her foster parents, um, with the, all of them in the room and essentially with T as well and really seeing how that plays, depending on the specific uh, aims of the therapy that you're doing. As Kirsty also mentioned, attachment-based frameworks such as circle of security being, can be helpful even if you can't get into a full program, utilising the framework and the, and the uh, models behind it can be very helpful. Um, building a sense of competency between the foster parents and team in terms of communication and connection, what can we introduce into their lives together to build that connection and small uh, opportunities for um, fun and getting to know each other in a, in a light way when things are going well working alongside them to help them with it rather than intervening so you're the main character, you're actually just the conduit for the relationship between the parent and the child. Um, and Didact Developmental Psychotherapy by Dan Hughes has got some great examples of how in working with these with children such as T, you can help them to put words to what's going on. So not necessarily expecting her to come up with how she feels but providing some starters, other children that I've worked with that have sometimes feel angry or other children find scared and working with her to help her put words to her experience. Um, and yeah, finally, always working with hope, as Kirsty said, that this is a tough start in life, but with connected ongoing relationships and support that things can really improve for T. I think that's it.
Thanks so much, Nicola. That was uh, outstanding as usual. I'm uh, really interested in um, some of that content, um, particularly around that uh, behaviours often lasting longer than are adaptive. So we might have a chance to talk to you about that later. Um, I'd like to now welcome our third uh, panellist for tonight, uh, Dr Elizabeth Hone, uh, who's going to provide us with a psychiatrist's perspective. Um, so Elizabeth, welcome once again. Um, Elizabeth, so I think you might just be on mute there. So, um, sorry, Dan. Yes, six now. I think is that right? Yeah, that's yep. better. Thank you. Okay, my yep. apologies. Um, I really wanted to take a perspective that took us perhaps to um, Kirsty and Nicola have really provided us with a lot of great thinking about um, collaborative practice, working together. The really key issues in how we approach T and her family to support them psychologically and on a day-to-day -day basis. And I kind of wanted us to think a bit what was happening in the background too um, for T and um, really lend that perspective, I think, to the conversation. So to me, um, a big part of my role as a psychiatrist and the work I do is to build resilience and to really, my goal is to achieve social and emotional well-being and long-term physical and emotional health for the infants and children that I work with. And having building resilience and making that outweigh risk is a really key part of that that I'm aiming for. So the adverse childhood experiences or ACEs can contribute, as we've seen, to poor lifelong outcomes in physical health, mental health, and beyond that. But the thing that we've got to remember with the hope sort of thing, it's actually not the individual risk factors that might impinge on development, but the most detrimental outcome we get is if we get this accumulation of multiple risk factors on a single child, and that's the bit that we're trying to prevent. And we also know that if you get four or more of those risk factors, then you're at significant um, risk. The risk just escalates exponentially. And that's what we're really looking at in T's case, unfortunately. She's been exposed to considerable adversity. She's in foster care and most certainly has had more than four risk factors. So what's happening for T in the background? I like to think about what's happening at a brain development level. We know that that's genetically activated, but it's also then directly influenced by social experiences and the child's environment. Um, and this is where she's really had a tricky start. We know the brain develops in a predictable, sequential, bottom-up fashion and that we really want that sequence to be happening properly. We have simple systems and pathways that are developing first and then they get ever integrated into ever more complex ones. But it's actually the social experiences, particularly in an interpersonal context, that are impacting how this is going. We also know the brain changes enormously throughout life. We now know from a lot of um, older person's um, research that that plasticity is there throughout our lives. But it's actually the rapid changes in the first three years of life that work to create our core brain architecture. And so we need to be thinking what's happened for T in this period of time. Her adverse experiences they may well have disrupted her healthy brain development, particularly where there are sensitive areas of development such as language development, her orbitofrontal cortex which is involved in motivational behaviour such as feeding, drinking, particularly in relation to reward and punishment related behaviour and therefore in how she controls herself emotionally and interacts socially. So we know from the brief information we have that T actually struggles to control her emotional distress at times and engages in um, inappropriate social interactions. And therefore we can be thinking that it's very likely that she's got some of this damage and disruption to this sequential brain development has happened for her. And so we need to be kind of thinking about that as well as we're trying to work out how best to help her. One of the consequences of having this 
um, effective sequential brain development happening is that we develop self-regulation and executive functioning. These are brain control processes by which we learn to influence our emotional expression, manage complex tasks, stay focused, empathize with others, and understand the impact of our actions and modify them. As infants aren't born with these control processes, they absolutely rely on their caregivers to regulate their internal physiological state. This is called co-regulation, and it helps the infant develop a template for their own future self-regulation, and it's what actually builds our resilience. So what happens when you have adverse experiences is that you actually impair the development of this self-regulation because you don't have enough of this co-regulation experience. And that in itself then infects our executive functioning. We know from the examples, that the story that was given that T lacked a lot of these experiences. My guess is that she was far from having sufficient experiences of co-regulation from her biological parents. And so we can expect that she's got compromised development at this point in time of her executive functioning and her capacity to self-regulate her emotions and behavior. This is important to kind of bear in mind when we're thinking about what might actually be happening for her, what diagnosis we might end up giving her because we need to hold in mind that she has this impairment of her regulation and executive functioning happening. She's presenting with social and emotional delays and she's struggling to safely use adults to soothe her emotional distress. So the other thing that kind of comes into play, as Dan mentioned right back at the beginning, is toxic stress. When the body's stress management system is activated, there's an increase in heart rate, blood pressure, stress hormones, in particular cortisol, and proteins associated with inflammation are released into the bloodstream. These responses are all healthy responses when our body is stressed. They prepare us to deal with threat and they're essential for our survival in those circumstances of threat. And that's fine if it's short term and it's the threat is actually something that's very real to our survival. When a child's stress response systems are activated in an environment of supportive relationships with adults, that co-regulation kicks in that we talked about. And these physiological effects that happen in the body are then buffered by this interpersonal positive experience and are brought back down to baseline. The result is the development of a healthy stress response system. We know that stress can be positive, tolerable or toxic. Positive stress is brief and mild, while tolerable stress is serious but still temporary. And in both of these cases, the responses return to baseline when the threat is resolved and their impact is buffered by supportive relationships. So what about toxic stress? Toxic stress occurs when the stress response is extreme and long lasting and we don't have those buffering relationships and co-regulation available for the child. Toxic stress can damage and weaken the brain's architecture and control systems. It can impact learning, emotional regulation, behavior and health. When it becomes chronic or is triggered by multiple sources, it can have the accumulation of effect that I talked about earlier on an individual's physical and mental health. And we now know that that can last throughout their life course. We know that T's experienced toxic stress in her early years living with her biological parents. Therefore, we can assume that that's impacted T's body, her brain development, her emotional regulation, her social interactions and her behavior. So how can we think about then going about repairing these ruptures to brain development, to other aspects of her development and to help her build resilience now going forward because as the previous two presenters have spoken about, there is this hope that is so essential to maintain in all of this. So we know that positive outcomes for children in the face of adversity can be achieved if we have the ensure, ensure that there's the presence of positive and supportive relationships with caring adults, that we support the child to develop a sense of mastery 
self-control and self-efficacy because so much of that has been lacking in their lives so far. Helping them to create a coherent narrative. For T, and this is, large, this is very much tied with language development, in her experience and her lack of co-regulation, she will have lacked this coherent story of who she is understanding herself, her identity, who she belongs to, and a lot of work needs to go into trying to help her to do that. Providing her with opportunities and support to repair and strengthen her weakened brain architecture. Scaffold her to build adaptive skills for self-regulation and executive functioning. And as I said, maintain hope at all times. So for T, a warm, positive, stable and committed relationship with her foster parents would be the single most important factor to reversing this, the damaging effects of the toxic stress and the adverse experiences she's had and will from there help her develop a resilience that will take her forward on a much more positive trajectory. So thanks, Dan. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. Um, that was a really great presentation and, and lots of questions coming from the chat room. And so maybe we might uh, uh, start with a question for you, if that's okay. Um, and I know that throughout your presentation, you talked about um, the fact that brain plasticity is ongoing throughout the course of a lifetime, which, which kind of corresponds with the question that Robert uh, has asked, which is um, that, that uh, T, um, uh, missed out on some of those key developmental regulations at an early age. But does that mean that she's missed the boat in terms of um, being able to recover from that? Or is there, um, is there a way that we can work with, with T to, to kind of uh, make sure that, that she's able to recover from some of those experiences? I think we can, um, we know that we can recover a lot of that functioning. I think there's this kind of graph that you can think of. In the first three years of life, the brain is absolutely wired to develop its architecture. And so everything happens almost on autopilot and very quickly and efficiently. From there on, as you move through life, recovery still happens, changes happen in the brain all the time, and we can build new pathways all the time. But everything takes longer and it's slightly harder and it just doesn't work as quickly and as efficiently. What we know is that what will happen is with her new experience with her foster parents, if that's a positive experience and is predictable and consistent and stable, that she will then develop a new pathway next to that old pathway, that those old pathways that she's developed. And the more that happens, the same predictable, consistent relationship, the stronger that new pathway will become. And then as that new pathway becomes stronger, the brain will start to prune out the older, less efficient pathways, the damaged pathways, and the ones that she then no longer needs. But that's going to take time. Unfortunately, we do know from the research that there are some sensitive periods of development that need a lot more work and may not entirely recover. But I think the really important thing is the more that she has this positive relationship, the better that's going to be in terms of her future. And she's still quite young at this point in time. The thing is we don't know when she was brought into foster care. So that's at the moment probably a fairly hard question for me to be really specific about. We know that ideally you'd want to be removed from your parents in this kind of situation and come into care before 24 months. Um, because of how the orbitofrontal cortex and some of those parts of the brain that are highly dependent on positive relationships develop. Thanks for that, Elizabeth. Kirsty, I might go to you next um, because we do have quite a lot of interest um, in this area um, on this particular question. And from your perspective, uh, can you talk to us a little bit about what the long-term effects are from ACEs um, and are these manageable in later childhood or um, in adolescence and adulthood? Um, yeah, sure. Well, I mean, look, there the long terms clearly are significant and diverse. Um, and, you know, in, in my daily practice, it can be um, 
greater instances of depression, um, greater instances of dysfunctional relationships, um, uh, abnormal eating behaviours, um, uh, higher incidence of um, diabetes, uh, heart disease. It's, it's really very diverse. And again, it's um, you know, uh, as a GP, we treat the person, not the disease. And so it's about developing a long-term, mutually respectful relationship and, and working with an individual about what is, what is their priority now and how can we support them and move them forward. Um, and so sometimes you will um, work with somebody who's um, got depression and, um, and really is just wanting to, to be very forward thinking and move forward from now, but then later on they'll develop something else and, and you know I've certainly worked with adults for many months if not years before they have felt comfortable disclosing um, adverse childhood experiences and then wanting to think about how that might have affected where they're at at the moment. So um, the, the effects are very widespread. I've found the more you ask the more you find and uh, it's it's really then, do you have to unpack them all for everybody? No, I don't think so. Sometimes it's part of a history and and it's acknowledged and they want to move forward. At other times it's something that they haven't really dealt with and it's um, had a, an insidious effect that they have maybe not been aware of and it, and it can be very helpful to then go back and, and address it. Um, so it, it is variable and sometimes you uh, refer to psychological support early and sometimes that's just not, not wanted at all. Hmm. Yeah, thanks Kirsty. I might just um I might just uh, ask another question from that as well. So if we take T as a, a case example, um are there preventative practices uh given the ACEs that she has been through? Um that we can apply in our work with her, which you think would um, have a good chance of um, ensuring that later adverse effects um, aren't as serious or as negative? Well, I mean, I think Elizabeth has already covered, Elizabeth and Nicola have already covered them. I mean, as much as possible, um, if we can in, encourage sort of supportive, ongoing relationships in a, a stable environment that has wraparound support so that she is laying down those more adaptive behaviours and uh, more functional and efficient neural pathways, um, then you know that, that is the ideal. But also I think being, um, um, you know, I think for me that's one of the joys of, of general practice is that you, you often are in a, have a long-term relationship and you can see people evolve over many, many years. Um, and it's not like you need to have, um, having an awareness of, of, of adverse childhood experiences doesn't have to penetrate every single consultation, but it's always helpful to know in the back of your mind um, because it may um, make you think of slightly different ways of, of approaching things. I, I was thinking, you know, just recently I um, was um, asked to um, see a, a woman who I hadn't seen before but had been a, a long-term patient of the, of the practice and she just wanted a routine pap smear. But when I was doing the routine pap smear, which was you know, very technically easy to do, she was obviously quite distressed. Um, and, but I'd only met her once before and so just as I was writing the labels, I said, look, I hope you don't mind me asking, but I noticed when I was doing your pap smear that you found it very difficult and sometimes that can occur for people who've experienced previous abuse in their childhood. Do you think that might be an issue for you? And if it is, do you want, is that something you'd like to talk about? And she just looked at me, she said, no, no, not at all. And then as I was finishing writing the label, she said, well, yes, but I don't want to talk about it. I said, fine. Um, but just if, if you ever do, then I'm happy to discuss it with you. Um, now she continued to see other doctors at the practice for another six, 12 months, and then came to see me again. Um, with another physical health problem, um, but at the end said, I might want to see a psychologist about what happened in the past. So I think 
you need to be open, you need to be working at the pace that the patient is comfortable to work at. And, and you know, that's obviously very different for children versus adults. Um, but I think having that understanding of, of that in the past can help you be more proactive and take, if you like, secondary prevention approaches in, in all of the diversity of the medical care you're providing. Yeah. Thanks, Kirsty. Um, so, Nicola, uh, I want to ask you a question now because we're getting lots of um, questions really through the chat room. Um, just in terms of this uh, idea of backhanded compliments, and just wondering yeah. if you could extend upon uh, your explanation of that a little bit. Sure. So, the backhanded compliment is a term that I came across um, when we were looking at and kind of talking about the experiences that a lot of uh, caregivers have, particularly foster carers um, who have foster children in their care, come into their home and things going really well. Or it could also be any teachers trying to engage with children. Um, things are going really well and that child may have been difficult to engage or been resistant or uh, yeah, it's just taken a little while to make the connection and things seem to be going really well. And in uh, foster care, they often talk about the honeymoon period. So a child comes into your care and that, foster, that um, honeymoon period where everything's smooth and great and wonderful can last anything from six hours to six months. Um, but almost inevitably, it, 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 it kind of comes to a, an end, um, in, not forever, but in terms of an escalation, uh, often a, a, a kind of big blow up and often a very big blow up. And, and by that, I mean, um, so some kind of argument or fracture between the, the child and the adult. And in that, often children, particularly those that have had significant adversity, um, can really push a button in their caregiver. They kind of know how to hurt them. And so you have this real rupture in the relationship where things have been going along and the adults have been trying and trying and trying and doing everything according to the textbook to connect with the child and provide this safe and secure and stable relationship and it gets thrown back in their face. And, and so what we mean by the backhanded compliment is that uh, we would see that as things, you're doing the right things. Um, so what is happening is you've gotten close and close and close and the child is um, being uh, responding to that and so forth, then all of a sudden they've hit their limit and they're unable to cope with it anymore and it's triggered in them usually an unconscious, you know, unintentional explosion. Something has, has triggered a fear response in them and they have lashed out against that and rejected that caregiving. Um, and that's the backhand compliment is that you're getting somewhere, you're getting close, but unfortunately at that moment the child can't tolerate it. And so in that circumstance we talk about the need A to support the adult, it happens in therapy, um, when you're working with a client and all of a sudden they lose it with you and start screaming at you or storm out or you know do say something really mean, that's a backhanded compliment as well often. If um, And so the adults that experience it need support because it hurts, because they're human as well, um, but also support to go back in, particularly the children because they have responsibility for the relationship and just as important, if not more important, is the repair. So going back into the child and not in that moment, the next day or the days afterwards, talking about what happened, um, reassuring them that they're not going to be rejected or that's not going to be the end of the relationship, but we're going to work about how we how can um, move on to that or understand or prevent that from happening in the future. So that's what we mean by that backhanded compliment. Thanks, Nicola. And, and while we're talking to you, um, we have a really great question from Kieran who's asked, um, uh, to you, that you mentioned that uh, psychotherapy might be a really good uh, therapy uh, for a team uh, to help her to put words to her experiences. So, in light mm -hmm. of this, uh, Kieran's just wondering what, what might be some of the theoretical orientations you take as a psychologist um, doing that. So, in terms of how we might work in a yeah. therapeutic relationship with me, yeah. um, she's only little, yeah, she, she's only three. Remind us how yeah, old she is. Six, yeah. Six. Okay, three six, or six. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Development. Six, three, um, yeah. I, I think in terms of how therapeutically you would work with T, it would always be in relation to her foster parents. And so um, you're not just going to take T off on her own and work with her with no regard for the relationship between the caregivers because as we've all talked about tonight, that is going to be the most restorative thing and protective um, thing for T in the long term. So working with uh, T and her foster parents 
around their goals. What what are their primary objectives? And so you might work in an attachment based framework where you're looking at the 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 roles and responsibilities in the household, the role of communication, um, how that is playing out in behaviour and and working together with the with T and her her parents to look at how that can be developed and in an ongoing in an ongoing way and have some experiences of success of meeting needs and understanding. Um, that's why the circle of security can be really helpful. That kind of mapping of where she may be and what her needs may be because she's got some pretty ingenious ways of hiding her need um, or expressing her need in a way which makes it hard for, for caregivers to to respond to it um, well. And so I think the theoretical models that I don't tend to work on one specific way, which can be frustrating for people to listen to me, I suppose, but um, I suppose it's informed by an understanding of the impacts of trauma and adversity on children, informed by attachment theory and, and informed by what the family want to do. So you might be working um, with play therapy or narrative therapy with uh, tea through drawing and art and those sorts of means as well, but also really the relational thing I think is what I'd be working with most um, in terms of scaffolding and, and supporting the relationship between tea and her foster parents. And I hope that answers the question. Yeah, it does. Thank you for that, Nicola. That's great. Um, Elizabeth, a question uh, from you for, for one of our registrants. It's asked that um, ACEs in, in children can often result in uh, you know, long-term anxiety. Uh, and do you agree that anxiety needs to be looked after professionally and um, kind of nipped in the bud so that children can unlearn um, the anxious feelings of children? Uh, when they encounter other events in their lives? Um, I think my answer to that would be yes and no. I think there's, um, as we've already seen tonight with um, Kirsty's comments and Nicola's um, comments, there is a real role for um, professional help. But the key remains, I mean, professionals only see people in for short bursts. So, the key remains that the foster parents are the ones that can do so much to help um, reduce this anxiety, to support T and children like T, to really get that anxiety under control. And that, that really is a number of different things. It's staying with the child when they have their emotional outbursts, when they lose it, um, just waiting for that to calm down. A lot of good parents do this intuitively and so we would hope that her foster parents can be predictable and consistent enough and it is not a perfect situation but to do it enough of the time to be able to just sit with her and let her know that someone can actually sit through this with her. And if she starts to learn that she's not alone in this anxiety, she's going to start having that experience of co-regulation that she didn't have with her biological parents at the beginning. And this is something that we do need to, re she needs to re-experience this in a new way and learn that someone can sit with this, that her anxiety is not going to overwhelm her and that they can then help her to find ways of managing this and coping with it. So. I like to kind of think of the fact that there are kind of two important components to that. The first is this being with or being able to calm down the anxiety. So we know that it's actually the amygdala in our brain, that's our smoke alarm, so to speak, in our brain. It is the thing that registers our fear and it's the thing that then sparks off our fear response and makes us feel this anxiety. So we actually need to calm this part of our brain down. And we know there are two really, really good ways of doing that very quickly. One is to be able to effectively use relationships to do that. And to be able to do that, she needs to have this experience of co-regulation often enough to be able to trust that. And it, when T came into care, she probably didn't have that capacity at all because she hadn't had enough of that experience. And so as both Kirsty and Nicola have said, this takes time of this consistent caring relationship for her to be able to trust that this can happen and to be able to use adults to calm down. The other way of calming down, which we often as adults can use, 
is to kind of do mindfulness type activities, relaxation type activities, deep breathing. So for a six year old, even simple yoga exercises, there are um, apps online like um, Cosmic Kids, those sorts of things can be really helpful. Using meditation type music, um, guided imagery, music, all of which you can get in apps. Um, all of these things are other ways that you can help. Teaching them um, to blow bubbles through straws to actually learn to um, control their breathing. Um, being able to breathe in and out for as long as a feather floats down. There are lots of practical strategies to kind of build that part of their brain. So once you've done that sort of training and learning to calm down, being able to use her foster parents and other adults to do that, the other key activity that the foster parents need to do is to help her build alternate strategies, help her to develop coping skills, to be able to say, that didn't work so well last time, I wonder how we could do that differently. Or I wonder what else you could do, to be curious about alternative types of behaviours because that's actually what helps her build new pathways to better executive functioning. But those sorts of things can happen in that day-to-day, moment-by-moment thing, and that's the crucial part. There is a place for professionals to scaffold that and support that, but it's actually the foster parents and the day-to-day, -day, everyday experiences that will really reinforce that and build that. Thanks so much for that, Elizabeth. Um, our next question is from uh, Alice, who's asked um, uh, about uh, the content that um, Kirsty and Nicola were talking about, shame, and how to avoid this as a, as a practitioner. So um, maybe Kirsty can, can start, and then Nicola, you might add to add, add something. How do you avoid shame when working with uh, particularly parents um, so that they don't feel um, constantly that they've just done the wrong thing, but at the same time that they can get better at um, how they're providing support for their children's uh, mental health and social and emotional wellbeing. Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's about um, often very much listening to begin with and under trying to understand their perspectives and their motivations and their reasons for doing what they they've been doing and what they're trying to achieve by doing. So I think listening is critical um, and then trying to um, reflect that back but also potentially make suggestions around why trying something else might be, um, might be valuable. Um, and I think it, you know, underpinning this is, is a, a respectful and honest um, relationship and, and you don't, um, you know, dif different GPs work effectively with different families and, and often over time families and GPs end up with um, sort of patient and dyad that suits them both and it's the same with other, other health professionals I'm sure. So um, I think list, uh, making, to avoid shame you have to listen, you have to build a relationship on mutual respect and being honest but reflective. Um, and I think that if you've got a non-judgmental and interested and curious style and, and people feel that you really have them and their children's best interest at heart, then I think you can have some really challenging conversations and still, still manage to move forward. I think if people feel that you are um, delivering judgments or um, advice without, with some sort of theoretical background without, but without effectively contextualising it or putting it in the context of their lived experience, then that's when people feel shamed and feel turned off. I mean, that, that's I guess is my approach, but I'm sure Nicola's got some other thoughts. Thanks Kirsty. Yeah, Nicola, do you have, do you have some, some thoughts on that? Oh, well, Kirsty said a lot of what I was going to say, which I suppose is good. Um, <laughs> I think, yeah, absolutely. I think that the relationship that you have with the families you're working with is critical for that and um, there needs to be a lot of work going into that relationship and taking time to understand the adults in the child's life and their perspective and listening to them and what um, their hopes are and what their challenges are 
um, is it critical to, to, to be able to work honestly with them and be able to reassure them that you view them as doing the best that they possibly can and that, that you're going to work together to, to improve that, but no one is expecting perfection. And that just by them engaging with you is very making it very clear that they're keen to do better. So I think that is a start. But I think it's also important to recognise that you can't. Sometimes you can't, you can't help but evoke shame even if you don't want to, particularly if you're um, working with parents around parenting and um, if those adults themselves have experienced trauma and adversity, um, we all go to shame at some times. We feel judged even if the person delivering what they're saying isn't intending to do that. So I think it is important to, to note that you can't help but um, sometimes evoke shame in others. And if, uh, and it's important to acknowledge that and talk about that with the families. And I think one of the most helpful ways is, again, the parallel process. So working with the families around their experiences and how they experience emotions and how they feel about certain events. So what goes on for them when they experience these outbursts or um, provocative behaviour and understanding for them what, what's going on with them. And I think if you're having those rounded conversations about them and their feelings and how all of us have them at times and that it can become overwhelming, um, even shame at times, and then that can lead into a conversation if you can name it about how helpful or otherwise that is. And, and if we are evoking it, then what are we doing? You know, And, and we may have to uh, look at our own practice and how we're communicating things because um, when people are sitting in shame, they can't take on in, new information and they certainly aren't going to um, be able to do the best for themselves because we've, we've put them in a state that um, shuts that down. Thank you, Nicola. Um, and I, once again, thanks to all of the wonderful questions that are coming through the chat room. Um, I feel like it would be great to uh, sit here for another hour and, and continue to ask our panel of questions. But we are coming to the end of our, uh, our time together, so what I'm going to do now is to invite each of our panellists to just um, add a, a final summary or final observation um, uh, from tonight's topic. So uh, I might start with you, Kirsty, if that's okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess my, my final observation is um, it, they're incredibly important. They're um, unfortunately very prevalent and they have very diverse effects, I mean, ACEs on, on children. So I think being aware of them, asking about them and being prepared to work in the long term with families and children affected by them is is a really valuable contribution you can make to somebody's um, long-term health and well-being. Thank you, Kirsty. Um, Nicola, would you like to add some final comments? Yes, I think just to build on what Kirsty said, one thing um, we haven't necessarily talked about a lot tonight is some of the uh, concern about ACEs and the, the um, kind of ACEs movement or people talking about uh, asking people about their early experiences and the concern is that it can be seen just as another way, another a stick to beat parents with or um, an, another kind of diagnostic um, label to throw on children. And I think it's really important as we've been talking about tonight, the only use they can be is if they're used in relation to the whole child and, and an understanding of um, what they've been through and putting that in with all the other ev evidence and information and relational um, context that you have. So we would never advocate just asking around ACEs to get a number and not to do anything with it other than write it on a sheet of paper. It, it needs to inform what you're doing to make however you're working with the family more effective. Um, yeah. Thanks, Nicola. Um, and Elizabeth, your final thoughts? Um, just thinking, for me, there, it's really, there are three key things. One is about relationship and it's always about relationship and building that relationship with families at every level um, and also between us as a group of practitioners that are working together to support the families as Kirsty said right at the beginning um, having really good ways of communicating with each other. It's about building skills. We need to rebuild when we've been exposed to all these ACEs. It's really about rebuilding a sense of self-efficacy and mastery of the world because so often you don't have any sense of control. Um, that will then help you feel so much better about yourself and about your ability to move through the through life. 
And the third key area I think to think about is the fact that um, we really are trying to work about building something different internally, something that's not built on judgment, preconception, but really something that's changing how the child, the adult, the family are feeling internally about their personal experiences and who they are and really building that sense of identity and belonging and making that the really strong thing. Because if you have a strong sense of identity and belonging, then you're going to be resilient and be able to weather whatever life brings to you much better than otherwise. So I think the really key thing that I want to kind of finish on is that connection is ultimately important. And we often hear people sort of saying, oh, they're just attention seeking. But I'd really like to kind of leave us with the thought at the end that they're not attention seeking, but in fact connection seeking. And we are, have a role to kind of make sure that happens and really support building that connection. So thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you once again to all our uh, panellists tonight. I think you'll agree that uh, the, um, the presentations and the Q&A sessions have been um, really riveting, so thank you. Okay, so um, uh, we're getting close, obviously, to the end of uh, tonight's proceedings. So again, thank you to the over um, 1,000 of you who've, who've joined in um, tonight. That's been fantastic. Um, just uh, for your information, other supporting resources associated with this webinar can now be found in the Supporting Resources tab at the bottom of your screen. Uh, for more information about Emerging Minds, please visit our website at www.emergingminds.com.au or for MHPN, uh, this particular conference, visit www.mhpnconference.org.au. Remember, uh, in uh, this part of the, the conference, we've got some really exciting um, uh, online webinars coming up. On the 30th of uh, May, for example, we've got um, two sessions, one with uh, our child and family partners during the day and the other um, with some practitioners who will respond to our child and family partners. And of course, please don't miss the other half of this webinar which is on uh, the 6th of June at 7.15pm uh, Eastern Standard Time and that's talking about working with parents who have experienced adverse childhood experiences. So we're really looking forward uh, to bringing you that in a couple of weeks. Um, so again, thanks for participating. Please can you make sure that you, you click the feedback survey tab at the top of the screen. Uh, to open and complete your survey. We'd love to know what you've thought of tonight and um, uh, what we're doing well, but also what we could uh, do to improve um, what we provide for you. Uh, a certificate of attendance will be uh, issued for you as part of this webinar um, and will be available for you within six weeks. Each participant will be sent a link to the recording of this webinar and associated unloaded resources within four weeks. And please again visit www.mhpnconference.org.au for details on the upcoming webinars as part of the Trauma and Abuse Child Experiences part of this uh, online conference. So um, this webinar was co-produced by MHPN and Emerging Minds for the Emerging Minds National Workforce Centre for Child Mental Health Project. The project is led by Emerging Minds but is delivered in partnership with the Australian Institute of Family Studies, the Australian National University, the Parenting Research Centre and the Royal Australian College of Junior Practitioners. The project is funded by the Australian Government Department of Health under the National Support for Child and Youth, and Youth Mental Health Program. Uh, MHPN supports the engagement and ongoing maintenance of practitioner networks where clinicians from different disciplines meet regularly with other mental health practitioners. Uh, and uh, they'd like to invite you to continue to learn about what happens as part of this network through mhpn.org.au. Before I close, I'd just like to acknowledge the consumers and carers who've lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. Thank you to, for everyone uh, for participating in this evening's um, webinar and we really look forward to uh, meeting you again soon as part of this.